So welcome, welcome to the Geological Society of London and welcome to this, the first Burlington House lecture. It's themed around the Thames and is designed to coincide with the Olympics. This is an overall theme of the Thames through time, this series of lectures. The Burlington House lectures represent a collaboration between the Royal Academy and the five learned societies that occupy this historic building. They are the Antiquaries, the Astronomicals, the Linnaean Society, the Chemists, and ourselves, the Geologists. My name is David Shilston. It's my pleasure as President-designate of the Society to welcome you here today. Our speaker tonight will take us on a journey through the history of London's river, the Thames. It's an astonishing story through the last two million years until the end of the last Ice Age. Through this time, Old Father Thames has witnessed dramatic changes. We will find about its origins, past environments, early human habitants, and the latest scientific advances in our understanding of its history. To guide us through this amazing story, we welcome Professor Danielle Shreve. Danielle is Professor of Quaternary Science and a vertebrate paleontologist at Royal Holloway, University of London. Her research focuses on Ice Age mammals, and as well as an extensive publication list, she has contributed to numerous radio and television programmes, including Channel 4's Time Team and The Birth of Britain. Danielle is also a former president of the Geologists Association and fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. So she's very much on home territory here in Burlington House. She's a core member of the acclaimed Ancient Human Occupation of Britain project, a major initiative to bring together a range of specialists to investigate the ebb and flow of human populations in Britain and Western Europe. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Daniel Shreve. Thank you, David. And uh, good evening, everybody. It's a true pleasure to be here, um, to be able to, to give the first of the Burlington House lecture series this year. And as David has said, my topic is the Thames through time. Um, so what I'm going to do is to hopefully illuminate you, entertain you in parts about uh, the distant uh, prehistory, I suppose, of the river and populate the banks with early humans, with flora, with fauna. And we'll look at the impact of changing climates and changing environments through time. Now, when we think about the Thames today, it's very, very difficult as we step out onto Piccadilly to imagine what the landscape was like without the city around us. And indeed, the building the construction of our city has changed the landscape so much, but there are vestiges of its former glory still there. Now, we might think of the Thames in terms of cultural associations, industrial, uh, even transportation. We might think about its sporting associations, especially with the Olympics coming up, uh, defence, or even environmental concerns. And indeed, today, of course, with the cleaning of the Thames, we now have a river that is um, flooded with freshwater fish. But one association that you probably don't necessarily make is one that is close to my heart, and that is associating the Thames, a Thames in the not-so-distant distant geological past that was heaving and honking with hippopotamus. <laughs> We think of the Thames today as a gentle, meandering, large lowland river as it makes its way. It's the longest river uh, running through England. It makes its way from uh, its source up in the Cotswolds down to the estuary near South End on Sea. And you can see here a typical interglacial or temperate climate river, so the gentle, meandering <laughs> bends of the river. But you don't have to go back too far. Um, certainly into the 1800s, or even, in fact, back at, as far as 1963, so certainly easily within living memory, where we've had periods where the Thames has looked rather different. Um, and here, of course, we've got uh, an artistic depiction of the Great Frost Fair at Blackfriars in the early 1800s. And here in the 60s, the frozen Thames at Windsor, so people walking on the frozen river. These, of course, are short-lived periods of cold climate and indeed you could go back into the Middle Ages, into the Little Ice Age, to see much more sustained 
periods of cold where the landscape would have changed. And, in fact, where the river would have changed, it would have altered from this meandering uh, river that we know today to a, a braided river that uh, wanders across a relatively bare and often treeless floodplain. So as we go back through time, we need to appreciate the complexity of that climatic record. And hopefully you can see in the central part of this slide a very simplified record of climate from effectively the last two and a half million years right the way up to the present day. And obviously on the right hand side, in the red, we have periods of warm climate. And in the blue, we have periods of cold climate where Britain was often, but not always, covered in ice sheets. And you'll see that there is an alternation between those warm and cold episodes. And this has shown us a relatively crude scale. It's information that is derived from the deep sea cores. But the important point, really, is that there is an acceleration of those climatic oscillations after about two and a half million years ago. And then really, from about this point in the story onwards, we move into a period where every 100,000 years we are swinging dramatically from times of savage, intense cold, frequently with large ice sheets over the Northern Hemisphere, alternating with periods of relatively warm climate where Britain was certainly as warm as today and in some cases substantially warmer. These climatic oscillations have had a tremendous effect on our river. And you can see um, that here we have, just shown here, some of the gravel deposits that were laid down by that river over time. And certainly the Thames record extends back in excess of at least two million years. So how is that record expressed on the land? Well, you can see a wonderful spread of those gravel terraces, the sands and gravel deposits that were laid down by the river as it moved over this part of the landscape. And here we're looking at the Upper Thames catchment around Oxford and then the Middle Thames really around the area of Reading extending into central London. And you'll see these wonderful spreads mapped by the Geological Survey um, in, certainly in this part of the record where the Middle Thames has one of the best preserved records of those, uh, those Thames deposits. And we can broadly um, split up the Thames into three parts. The Upper Thames, centred around Oxford. The Middle Thames, uh, around the areas of Reading and extending into central London. And then finally, the Lower Thames, where the river enters the sea. So we have the estuary and the river enters the sea. And the terraces are preserved in varying proportions between those three different parts of the river because, of course, there is a legacy of erosion, of dissection, of incision that has left sometimes just small remnants of those river deposits preserved. If we look at a schematic cross-section of those terraces, we can see very readily that there are substantial differences between the different parts of the valley. So these are schematic cross-sections through the upper part of the valley on the left, the middle Thames in the centre, and the lower Thames east of London on the right-hand side. And of course, as you move down towards the coast, of course, the gradient drops substantially. So the river is cutting down from a high point to a base level where it meets the sea. <coughs> the river deposits are forming um, a staircase, if you like, of sort of bench-like sediments, um, which are now preserved on the valley sides above the modern floodplain. And you can see here that the most complete sequence is within the Middle Thames, um, between the areas of Reading and Rickmansworth. The driving force for terrace formation is climate change. And it's combined here with progressive uplift of the land. So southern Britain has been slowly lifting up, and that's what's helped to preserve this sequence of terraces. 
So these little terrace deposits are effectively remnants of former floodplains which are now left high and dry above the modern river. They're abandoned or incised as the river continuously cuts down to new lower levels. And that means that the highest terraces are the oldest and the youngest terraces are down here close to the floodplain. The situation in the Lower Thames is more complex because here we have two sets of Thames terraces preserved, one of which is much older and relates to a course of the river prior to half a million years, and then the Lower Thames, which is a much better known sequence that relates to effectively the last half a million years. And I'll talk more about the importance of these in due course. And in fact, even in London itself, where our, our, sort of, our sense of um, the, the vertical separation of those terraces is somewhat dimmed by the amount of excavation and building, you can still pick out the terraces. If you walk around parts of London away from the river, you should be able to um, find yourself. So here, for example, we've got um, the South Bank, we've got Waterloo Station here, and the London Eye. And you can see that there is part of... The bank here, which is the most recent, it's the lowest, uh, and it relates to the last 10,000 years of deposition. And then as you walk away from that point, you come up onto the floodplain terrace slightly higher. And over the other side of the river, we have the middle terrace of this part of the Thames Preserve, so still higher. So it is still possible to walk up the streets of London and to get a sense as you move from one river terrace level up to another. So we'll start at the beginning of the story, two and a half million years ago, when the paleogeography of Britain was very different. And you'll see straight away that one of the most obvious features is that we are still connected at this point by a land bridge across what would later become the Straits of Dover. Now, north of this bridge, the southern part of the North Sea extends into areas that are now well inland. So uh, marine deposits occupied much of eastern England and into the Thames Basin to the west and into the Netherlands to the east. We have the start of our ancestral Thames um, and this, together with other major European rivers, particularly the Rhine-Meuse system, and also this large extinct river, the Baltic River. These are large rivers that are flowing into the North Sea Basin. They're vigorous braided systems that start up in response to the climatic cooling that we see starting at about two and a half million years ago. And these rivers deposit very extensive uh, terrestrial sequences, also creating huge deltas out into the southern part of the North Sea Basin, where they come into contact with these very red, sandy and shell-rich deposits that are the marine crags, as they're known. Now, we have very little evidence from the Thames of what the landscape was like at this time. Most of it is covered in a shallow marine sea. But we do have some evidence um, from vertebrate fossils, of animals that died in terrestrial environments and then were washed down estuaries and incorporated into, um, into the crag deposits. And really, the early Pleistocene fauna from about two and a half million on years onwards is very much a, a sort of relic, to the last remnant of the sort of tropical Pliocene forested forms that we see. So the kinds of things that we find in Britain at this time are tapirs, it's fantastic having tapirs running around Britain, um, small carnivores such as um, a relative of the red panda. We have some very large uh, elephants. So this is Mammuthus meridionalis, the great southern mammoth, uh, the, the distant ancestor of the woolly mammoth. But we also have a second elephant as well. So this is a mastodon. You can see it's got a much lower and squatter body than, um, uh, than the mammoths. It also has rather different, much lower crowned teeth. And of course, these great straight projecting tusks. Porcupines, 
and also some very interesting fossils of a large northern cheetah. And you can see that cheetah reconstructed, this extinct cheetah, against a modern cheetah today. So a large-bodied form of northern cheetah. So really interesting and exotic fauna at this time. We can see that the Thames was also <coughs> draining a rather different area to the area that we know um, today forms the headwaters. And that's because as well as exotic uh, pebbles that are brought down, so things like igneous rocks, but also carboniferous rocks. The three main river systems that are active in this area, so the Ancaster River system to the north, the extinct Bytham River, which drained most of the Midlands and then entered um, the sea in Suffolk, and the Thames particularly, is drawing and draining um, this area, so from the West Midlands up into the Welsh borders and into Wales itself. And as well as those exotic lithologies, we also find different polynomorphs, so microscopic spores and pollen that are being drawn from these source areas and being deposited by the river along its course. So we're able to reconstruct very closely the past patterns of the river in excess of two million years ago. As we go through time, the Thames remains in a relatively constant position, but the Bytham River starts to extend its headwaters until eventually it beheads the Thames and the Thames moves much more into um, its, its sort of Pleistocene position um, and the Bytham, which will later be completely obliterated, becomes the most important river in the Mills. At this time, we are still connected to the continent. And, of course, these major river systems act as superhighways for people and animals coming in from the continent. So we maintain a land bridge connection to the continent. And it's around this time that we start to find the very first evidence of early humans. Evidence is poor from the Thames area itself because the river will later be diverted and a lot of the evidence obliterated. But in East Anglia, so not too distant, certainly on the coast, we're picking up some very exciting sites that demonstrate the earliest occupation of Britain. <coughs> One of these is a key site at Pakefield near Lowestoft. Uh, you can see some of the flint flakes that have been recovered from the site. And it's of interest because around this time, say 650,000 years ago, it's a time when we had an almost Mediterranean climate. So warm summers, well in excess of mean summer temperatures. So in this part of Britain, we're looking at mean summer temperatures of around 16 degrees centigrade. So summer temperatures between 18 and 23 degrees centigrade. We can tell this on the basis of evidence from fossil beetles, but also from soil carbonates within the deposits and mild winters, minus six to plus four. We have some tentative evidence that we may even be looking at human occupation in excess of 700, 750,000 years ago. Um, but at the moment, these sites are, are relatively obscure and are still under investigation. Within the Thames itself, we have um, a very well-preserved channel deposit just outside Abingdon, and that's the site of Sugworth at around 600,000 years ago. There's no evidence of human artefacts from this site, but nevertheless it is telling us important paleoenvironmental information that we can then use to reconstruct the environment of our earliest human occupants. Here at Sugworth, we've got some interesting vertebrates preserved. So, for example, we have some rodents. Here we've got some archaic water vole teeth. These teeth of small mammals are very important because they show very rapid evolution through time and can be used as a proxy for understanding chronology. So the evolutionary patterns that we see in some of our smallest mammals are key for telling us where in time those sites are distributed. We also have some remains at this site of an extinct rhino, Etruscan rhino, and some important paleoclimatic information in the form of plant macrofossils, so seeds, um, fruits and so on, 
and two species in particular that tell us we're looking at a period of elevated temperatures. So here we've got water chestnut, and you can see very characteristic fruit of the water chestnut, Tropa natans, and also the floating water fern, Salvinia natans. Both of these are exotic to Britain today and tell us that climates were substantially warmer than at present. 450,000 years ago, we reach a pivotal point in the history of the Thames, and that coincides with the arrival of the most severe glaciation to hit Britain. So this is the Anglian glaciation around 450,000 years ago, where we see ice sheets coming down as far south as um, certainly North London and extending into Essex and equally covering large parts of Northwest Europe. The impact of this was to cause a rerouting of the drainage that we had seen up to this point. So the Thames started to feed its waters into what eventually became a huge ice dammed lake. So you've got ice down in the part, this part of the southern part of the southern North Sea Basin, and equally all these large rivers, the Meuse and the Rhine, draining into this enormous lake. Eventually, it is catastrophic overspill from this lake, which blasts a path through the chalk ridge that had connected us to the continent and creates this enormous channel river, which then feeds out into the southern Atlantic. So the impact of this ice sheet cannot be overstated. Not only did it completely remodel the landscape and the drainage, but it cuts off our access to the continent. What that means is that every time we go into a warm stage, sea level rises and Britain is cut off and it becomes an island. When we go into a period of cold climate, the glaciers are built up on land, sea level falls and we are reconnected to the mainland. So the windows of opportunity for colonisation are greatly reduced from that point. And this has a very, very profound effect, not only on humans, but also on the fauna as well. And what it effectively means is that some species, having experienced, retreated uh, far to the south, say during a period of cold climate conditions, they will migrate northwards, but some would be able to get into Britain before we were isolated, others would not. So it's almost like shuffling a pack of cards and dealing out a different set of animals for each one of the subsequent interglacials. If we look in more detail at what's happening in the Thames Valley at this time, here you can see the Anglian ice sheet, the lobes of till that we know from the Vale of St Albans, and here is the route of the Thames, which used to flow through the Vale of St Albans and then out, uh, obviously entering the sea um, up near Clacton. The impact of the ice sheet is equally felt in this part, where we have again the build-up of these large ice dammed lakes, and eventually it is a subsequent catastrophic overspill from those ice dammed lakes, which leads to the rerouting of the Thames through approximately the valley that it occupies today. So the impact of this glaciation was intense. The glacier itself leaves behind thick deposits of a chalky till, an Anglian glacial till, and this is everywhere. This is actually a famous site at Hornchurch Railway Cutting. And the interesting feature is that above the till, we can see renewed deposition of sands and gravels by the Thames. So we have a direct stratigraphic relationship between that glaciation and the next part of the Thames story. Although the Anglian was very severe and undoubtedly led to the local extinction of people from this part of southern Britain, there are some very enigmatic sites, um, particularly in the Reading area, for example. These are flake artefacts from the Cavisham Ancient Channel, which are believed to be of Anglian age. And when you look in detail at the climatic record for this particular glaciation, there are short-lived periods of relatively warmer conditions, perhaps allowing people briefly to make incursions into Britain. 
The next part of the story really relates to what happens after the Anglian glaciation. And uh, this um, schematic diagram is um, largely drawn from the work of my colleague David Bridgen from the University of Durham. Working on the lower part of the Thames Valley and undertaking a very, very widespread mapping project. So here we have a series of four terraces from our terrace staircase the last one of which, the youngest, is actually submerged below the modern river alluvium. And the terraces are made up of three components. At the base of the terrace, we have uh, a very coarse gravel, overlain by warm climate deposits, which are finer grains, sands, silts, clays, and so on, which preserve rich assemblages of fossils, and then we see a return to cold climate conditions again with the deposition of more gravel before the river cuts down again into its new lower level. And so for each one of these terraces, we have a sandwich of deposits which preserves not only a climatic record, but also a rich archaeological and paleontological record too. And although you don't need to appreciate the detail on here, these boxes give an illustration of the diversity of the different, the key forms of mammals that are characteristic for each one of these interglacials. We're now able to separate these interglacials and really to start to take them apart in terms of understanding both the climatic and envi environmental diversity, but also how early humans responded. And here we can see something of the archaeological record in the Thames. The coloured dots represent different industries. So orange, we have some of the most archaic, if you like, which are flakes and cores. In the, or in the green, we have hand axes. And then moving on to a different kind of industry made by some of the earliest Neanderthals. And then these late hand axes shown in the purple that are made by late Neanderthals themselves. And you can see there is a succession of these changing old Stone Age industries through time. And in fact, as we'll see, some of these terraces in particular are very complex indeed. They have different stone tools present within them, which is starting to tell us about how humans came and went from the continent. So if we start in the uppermost terrace up here, this is the highest and oldest terrace in this part of the Lower Thames. It's about 400,000 years old, and it directly overlies that Anglian glacial till. So we know that this warm stage came immediately after that period of glaciation. The site at Swanscombe near Dartford is incredibly famous. Uh, it's been known since uh, the 1800s when antiquarians would wander up and down um, in the old Portland cement um, quarries and in quarries that were being dug by hand um, for sand and gravel and collect artefacts such as these. So these are typical hand axes from Swanscombe. And here you can see uh, a few years ago where we cut sections through this important site. And there is incredible diversity within the deposits as we move on up through the sequence. This warm stage is very long, but it's not actually any warmer than the present day. We've got some very interesting species present. So, for example, things like uh, the extinct cave bear, this beautiful skull represented here. And in great numbers, denoting the abundance of woodland, we've got extinct fallow deer here. So this is a large-bodied form of fallow deer that is unique to this particular interglacial. And most important, we have three refitting <laughs> parts of an early human skull. So this skull, the species is Homo heidelbergensis, but it is starting to show the very earliest signs of evolution into Neanderthals, certain features within the skull itself. Now at Swanscombe, we have an alternation of archaeological industries. At the bottom of the site, we have simple flakes and cores, often referred to as Clactonian flakes and cores, and no hand axes. Later on, in the middle part of the sequence, we start to get hand axes appearing, and they are present right through the upper part of the sequence. But there is a very, very clear demarcation. We shouldn't forget also that, as well as stone tools, which are the most obvious and durable evidence that we have of early humans, because 
although Swanscombe is uh, obviously known for the, the early human skull, they are incredibly rare, human remains generally. But also, of course, organic artefacts are occasionally found. And this is a, a spear tip made from yew wood, which was found at a Thames site at Clacton-on-Sea, which lies in the same terrace as Swanscombe. So we have these changing archaeological industries, and because they are clearly separated in time, we've suggested that this might represent the influx of different people. So these are two different sets of people coming back into Britain before the island is cut off. So the first people who come in would be from areas such as the North German Plain, where there is no long history of hand axe manufacture. They come in, they have flakes, and they have cores. And then a second, later period of colonisation, people perhaps coming from France, from Spain, from Italy, the areas of Europe that we know have classic hand axe manufacture. So starting to see how humans are responding to the paleogeographical -geogra chain. We're also able to draw on different lines of evidence other than the mammal fossils themselves. We can look, for example, at evidence from fossil snails. And these are particularly interesting because this is a set of snails known as the Rhenish fauna uh, that are typical of northwest European continental rivers. So particularly, for example, the Rhine and the Scheldt. And midway through the Swanscombe sequence, we pick up these shells. And the most characteristic is this one, Theodoxus, with its beautiful stripy shell. But the whole suite is important. And what this is showing us is that there is a period of reconnection between the Thames and the Rhine. These aquatic mollusks are coming up the Rhine and then meeting the Thames uh, during a period of terrestrial reconnection and able to get into the Thames system and spread out from there. So this interglacial is important to us now, and this is really where research on the Thames is, is really sort of making strides in a way that we were not able to do in years gone by. Because we're now able to not only recognise separate interglacials, but to understand climate change through an interglacial. And that, of course, is key, particularly for us today, in trying to understand the path of the current interglacial and to try to decide whether we have any good analogues for those, um, uh, for, certainly in terms of past interglacials. When we look at records such as um, the Antarctic ice sheet records, it's clear that this particular interglacial has got at least two warm peaks in it, a big major peak here and then a more subdued peak here. And what we're starting to do is to maybe get some hint in the fragmentary terrestrial record of that kind of complexity. And here at Swanscombe, we have that complexity. We've got our sequence of sands and gravels. We've got evidence of temperate mammals and snails at the base. We have a period of reconnection to the continent, evidenced by the influx of the Rhenish fauna. We then enter a period of more boreal conditions where we have, for example, a marked reduction in woodland species, different animals coming in, such as lemmings, for example, and then a return to warm conditions at the top. So work on the Thames on this particular site, which has gone on since the 1800s, is still alive and giving us new insights into climatic change. The second terrace down um, in the Thames is, again, an enigmatic interglacial. It's one that was very, very poorly known, despite the fact that there was a great historical record from some of these important sites. So sites within uh, this particular terrace include this one here at Hackney Downs. So... Everywhere around us in London is full of um, evidence of early human activity. And we have largely to thank this particular character here. This is George Worthington Smith. And from the 1870s onwards, this antiquarian assiduously visited a proliferation of pits, construction, house building sites within North London and elsewhere, and collected magnificent suites of artefacts. And um, he was very lucky because um, I think it was his son was a pioneering photographer at this time, was able to maintain a photographic archive, which is so valuable for us to see these. But he would cycle around the pits and he would pay the workmen for finding these artefacts. 
The site itself was very poorly known, and of course is largely either built on or indeed in Abney Park Cemetery, where we've hesitated to go and dig holes, I have to say. Uh, it might yet happen, but a few years ago, we were able to go back to the Nightingale Estate in Hackney, where there were tower blocks being rebuilt, and we were able to drill uh, and create sections, sample from these sections. You can see some of the cores here, and these have proved to be absolutely fantastic. They are full of insects, plant remains of snails, and they're telling us that whilst there were early humans on the banks of the rivers making these hand axes, we were looking at, again, a warm climate with temperatures in excess of what we experience today. Further to the west, there are again some really exciting historic finds. And this, of course, I couldn't give this lecture on the Thames without mentioning the Furze Platte Giant. This is from Cannon Court Farm at Maidenhead. It's the largest hand axe known from Britain. It's just over 32 centimetres in length. It's enormous. I mean, if you visualise that, how could it have been used as a butchery tool? Was there some other meaning for this? And uh, this has come out of the same terrace, that second terrace down in the sequence. And the man who found it is this one. This is uh, a George Deffy Carter. Uh, Deffy because he was inordinately fond of gramophone records and he would use the money that he was paid for finding hand axes to buy these, uh, these records. And of course you can see him in action here. This is exactly what they would do. These pits were dug by hand, which is why we have this fantastic record still within our museums. And they would sieve the artefacts out by hand. And at Thurrock in the East End, um, so down towards the Lower Thames, we have again a range of really important sites and some pioneering work that was done there in the 50s and then later in the 1980s by Phil Harding and other colleagues. And um, really, the deposits are very well known from this site again. And interestingly, you can see that the, the lower part of the sequence is characterised by these flake and core industries. And above, we have hand axes in the upper part of the sequence. And here you can see some of those um, flint flakes illustrated. I have to put this photo in because uh, Phil is in the audience and he knew this was coming. But this shows Phil and David Bridgeland, the current president of the Geologists Association, <laughs> in their youth, digging at the site in Thurrock. And I think I'm right in saying that um, the get-up is entirely down to um, some rather angry bees in the area. Uh, and makeshift beekeepers' helmets had to be created. Phil is sporting one that is based around lampshade, whilst uh, Dave is using one that um, the prototype was from his old school boater. So, yes, we've come a long way since. So... A fascinating site in terms of its artefacts, but we knew very little at that time about exactly how old that site was. And yet immediately adjacent to the site, there had been old brick fields which had been dug in the 1820s, 1830s, and a spectacular series of mammalian remains recovered from them. Those are still in the Natural History Museum. There is not a mention of an artefact found there, but they are littered with cut marks from stone tools and hopefully you can just about pick out those of you that can see there are sharp slashes across these brown bare paws which have been left behind by butchery with flint tools absolutely characteristic marks it may well be that at the time the site had abundant flint artifacts but bear in mind that this is well before 1859 and the recognition of the antiquity of humans and it's possible that those artefacts were not recognised for what they are. Everything came together with um, the discovery and detailed work on this site. So again, this is in Thurrock area. And this is the site of Purfleet. And here we have um, an extraordinary sequence of deposits which relate to the very bank side of the Thames 300,000 years ago. So the Thames was cutting into a big chalk cliff at the back of the site. You can just about make out um, the Dartford Bridge in the background. And on top, we have this series of cold climate gravels at the base. And we then move in to interglacial deposits. And here we've got laminated clays. You can see these finely stratified laminated clays, which indicate warm conditions and high sea level. And above that, we have a wonderful deposit, the Purfleet shell bed. And you can see it's full of these fluvial shells. 
but it's also stuffed full of fossils. And then towards the top of the sequence, we have the return towards coarser, colder climate gravels. And this site really brought it all together because here we have the stratigraphic sandwich, we have our flake and core industries at the base, we have hand axes appearing higher up. And right towards the top of the sequence, we get the first evidence of Neanderthals. So this is a key site in terms of understanding the archaeological succession. It's also important for the story of the Thames because when the Purfleet site first came to light in the 1960s, it was not recognised as Thames, partly because when paleocurrent measurements were taken, it appeared to show that the river was flowing the wrong way. It was flowing from east to west instead of west to east, as you would have expected. Now, much wider ranging work by David Bridgeland has demonstrated that, in fact, in this part of the, the Thames, where we can see the gravel deposits, and the different terraces displayed here, the river was actually occupying a reverse S twist. And at the point where the quarry was cut, the river is actually flowing in the wrong direction. Now, that river later abandoned that course, leaving the Purfleet deposits high and dry, and that's why they are so well preserved in that particular area. We can see that the river, though, is large, slow-flowing. There are particular kinds of mollusks that tell us that it was deep water up to five metres deep. And we know from finding the opposite bank that the river was about a kilometre wide at this point. So although it was a shadow of its former self, it's still substantially wider than what we have today. And a fantastic array of woodland um, species present, so things like macaque monkey, uh, brown bear, we have spotted hyena, we have some small mammals such as white-toothed shrew that are now present only um, outside mainland, Europe, uh, sorry, mainland Britain and in more southerly parts of Europe, and also things like tree frog as well, again highlighting this interglacial as one of significant warmth. As we move towards the present day, we're on to the third terrace of the Thames. And again, we have huge, important historical sites at Ilford um, in northeast London from around 200,000 years ago. Now, again, these are brick pits that were being worked in the 1860s. And we're fortunate that there was a very well-known local collector, Sir Antonio Brady, who was able to amass this collection of fossils which was then sold to the Natural History Museum and has been preserved there ever since. And if you go into the Natural History Museum, in the front foyer, you will see this magnificent steppe mammoth skull with the tusks still in situ. But here are some of the other fossils that we find um, from Ilford. Magnificent, complete skull of aurochs, the ancestor of the domestic cow. Bison with the horn cores still intact. Uh, large jaws of an extinct kind of rhinoceros, so this is Merck's rhinoceros, a woodland species, and large numbers of wild horse. The flavour of this interglacial is very different. It's not particularly warm, but it's very, very open. So these are big, sort of steppic grasslands, but very, very rich, very diverse faunas, huge numbers of very large grazers. So quite different to what we've had before. And we've recently been able to pick up these deposits in, um, in Essex, so in the area of Averley, whilst the, a, the A13 extension was ongoing a few years ago. You can see I was working as the pilings are going in. And we've exposed large sections through these deposits. And this, of course, has given us an insight into the evolution of this interglacial, how it's changed over time. Uh, in a way that we, we simply couldn't get because of a lack of exposures and the building of sites in central London. And here we've got, um, for example, um, some associated rhino bones that were found at this particular level within the section. So we're still starting to, to try to, to pick up from those important historic sites and where we get opportunities to go out to new sites and to find more detailed information that we can, we can explore these sites with up-to-date methods. So I mentioned that Neanderthals were now on the scene, and we start to see Neanderthals, properly evolved Neanderthals, from about 250,000 years ago. And they're doing something rather different with their uh, stone tools. They still occasionally make hand axes, but now they are working cores of flint 
into almost like the, uh, the shell of a tortoise. So they will strike off flakes around the edge and then they will leave a flake of predetermined shape which they will then strike off. And those flakes of predetermined shape were then hafted into spears. We've got wonderful Neanderthal sites, both east and west. So Neanderthal sites in Acton, in Hanwell, and then as we move into um, Kent, we've got spectacular sites at uh, Northfleet and also at Crayford. And you can see these fantastic refitting flints. So these are sites that were in situ. They were very little disturbed from the moment the Neanderthal had made the tools. The artefacts were scattered and they were undisturbed. And then people have later come back, excavated these, and we can actually refit them and see the entire process as to how these artefacts were manufactured. And Neanderthals are using the Thames Valley. They were canny hunters. They were supreme predators. They were well organised. We see focused predation on particular species, particular age categories at particular times of year. And this, of course, shows uh, bison crossing a river in North America. But it makes the point that there were the Neanderthals knew their landscape so well and would have been able to use particular points in the river valley as points of ambush for hunting. And then finally, we're into the last interglacial. And the last interglacial is a desert for humans. There are no humans known anywhere in Britain at this time. And there are various reasons for that. Possibly that the glaciation that separates these two interglacials was very severe on the continent, and it may have caused humans to retreat so far south and east that they didn't have time to re-immigrate before we were cut off. And instead, we find um, a host of megafauna present and present in central London as well. These are some of the iconic sites for the last interglacial before present, only 120,000 years ago. Here we've got a magnificent hippopotamus canine tooth, which was discovered in the foundations of Uganda House in Trafalgar Square in the 1950s. And here we have a tooth also of hippopotamus that was found much earlier in Brentford in the early 1800s. So antiquarians have been finding hippopotamus fossils for quite some time, but it's really the Trafalgar Square finds that, that caught the imagination. And there's this super reconstruction um, from uh, the Illustrated London News from 1958, where you've got this magnificent reconstruction of, um, of Trafalgar Square 125,000 years ago, when lions really crouched where Nelson now stands. Uh, and you can see hippos present um, in the river deposits. We've got aurochs, we've got lions, uh, we've got brown bear, we've got red deer, we've got straight tusked elephant narrow-nosed rhino, so a fantastic fauna. And all around the Trafalgar Square area, of course, we have the remnants of this terrace. And uh, there have been elephant fossils found in Pall Mall, for example, a whole host of fossils in that immediate area. And if you imagine those deposits sort of three-dimensionally, we've got various um, different points around Trafalgar Square. So here is Uganda House itself. And you can map those deposits, the elevation. We've got the cold climate gravel at the base and then moving up into interglacial sands and silts. And what you're seeing here is actually the Molluscan record from those individual sites. And uh, this is the work of Richard Priest, and it tells us how the local environment is changing through time. So we start off in the gravel with predominantly moving water, but also some, uh, some ditch species in there and then as we move up through time we've got these um, individual lenses of detrital mud which is showing much more varied species preferences before we start to see drying out and the green indicates a predominance of land taxa so we're actually seeing phases of drying out of that particular part of the river bank and then as we come uh, into the last ice age, we see conditions deteriorate dramatically. Around 100,000 years ago, we've lost all our temperate elements. A lot of things like elephant, hippo, and so on would have left Britain. 
Many of them are retreating to, to southern Europe and will later go extinct from, uh, from those refugial areas. Around 100,000 years ago, there is a period of savage cold, winter temperatures down to minus 30. At Cassington in the Upper Thames Valley, at Isleworth in the Middle Thames, at Kew Bridge, we have large assemblages of reindeer found in association with bison, uh, interesting little carnivores like wolverine, and an enormous brown bear that is it's, it's bigger than the contemporary bison. This was a huge, huge predator. People are still absent at this time, and you can understand why. <laughs> but as we move through the last ice age, around 60,000 years ago, there is a period of climatic amelioration. And we start to see more diversity in the fauna. We start to see the development of very rich steppe tundra, supporting large numbers of megafauna. So things like woolly rhino, woolly mammoth, Horses are all present in large numbers. And we have, some, again, some spectacular finds from London itself. Beautiful woolly rhino skulls from Battersea um, and, uh, and from other parts of central London. And in association, at last, making a comeback, we have Neanderthals. So this is a late Neanderthal hand axe. It's triangular shape in form, which is very characteristic of this period. And this is actually an example from Hammersmith, but there are others in the Thames Valley. And it's really the response to a brief period of relatively milder conditions which perpetuates through the middle part of the last ice age. People are actually able to get back into Britain and obviously um, you know, use the landscape to their advantage for hunting. The paleogeography at this time, of course, we're, during, we're in a period of cold climate conditions, Britain is reconnected to the continent because of lowered sea level. And again, you can see the Thames Rhine system confluent here and flowing out into the Channel River. So the Channel River still represents a formidable barrier, but people would have been able to cross it in certain places and that way get into Britain, particularly using the Thames as a corridor for moving into parts of the South West uh, and South Wales where we have important sites. It's important to remember, though, that the climate is very variable at this time. So here we are coming from about 80,000 years, 100,000 years, up to <laughs> the present day. We've got the last interglacial and then that descent into savage cold when we have the reindeer and bison. And then this briefer period of warmth before we go into the last glacial maximum. Pretty much everything disappears from Britain. But if we look at more detailed records for the central part of the record between about 60 and 20,000 years ago. If we look at, say, for example, records from the Greenland ice core, you'll see that actually the climatic oscillations for this central period are immense. We're looking at changes of six to seven degrees, rapid oscillations, and it could have happened in a couple of generations. Neanderthals had to cope with that, but they also had to cope with modern humans who started to arrive in Europe from about 40,000 years ago. It's also at this time that we start to see a lot of the big megafauna starting to fail. They're on the rocky road towards extinction. And given that these are animals that take a long time to mature and to breed, having to cope with these kind of environmental perturbations was probably the last straw. We see humans, modern humans, appear briefly in the Thames Valley. Right at the end of the last ice age, there is a brief period of warmth. So we descend into severe cold 20,000 years ago and about 14,000, 13,000 years ago there is a brief period of warmth. And we see modern humans coming in, Neanderthals have gone extinct, so our species would have found itself as the sole species in the Thames Valley at this time. They're doing something rather different this time and they're making these long blades which would be used for a variety of purposes, but obviously would make excellent hunting tools as well. And um, just to um, the, the west um, edge of London, in the Staines and Chertsey area, we've recently found some very important sites that have come to light. So Way Manor Farm, where these wonderful long blades have come from, and Church Lammas, where you can see here this spectacular spread of artefacts from these excavation trenches. 
There's also a very, very famous site at Three Ways Wharf in Uxbridge, and there you get a very, very clear idea of what the people were up to. They're using hammer stones, they're hunting reindeer, so we've got reindeer foot bones here. They're making um, these tranche axes, so there's a place of axe manufacture. They're producing tiny microliths that would be hafted and used as projectile points. But there are also some interesting cultural artefacts, or artefacts that we really don't know what the meaning of them is. So, for example, this perforated antler base from Cyan Reach. And we have other examples of this kind of artefact. Perhaps it's ceremonial, perhaps it has a more practical purpose. We don't know what it's for. But they are found uniquely in association with modern humans during the very terminal parts of the last ice age. And at Three Ways Wharf itself, recently published uh, by John Lewis, um, we see fascinating insight into what the earliest representatives of our species in this part of the Thames Valley were up to. So here in the green, you've got scatters of bone debris. And here in the orange, you've got burnt flints. So these are campsites. And one of the most interesting things has been when you actually plot out the, the finds, you see that um, there is effectively people, there are circles of people gathered round campfires and they were butchering reindeer, there are bits of conjoining bones that are found between one campsite and another and there are places where bones are being dropped and places where bones are being tossed over their shoulder. And there was some fascinating um, ethnographic work done this is um, one of the Inuit sites, the Nunamiat mask site, where here, at the modern day, we've had exactly the same kind of situation. These hearths shown in black, these are the little figures clustered around, and the ethnographic observations show those same drop and toss zones around as people are throwing bone fragments. So it's quite nice thinking that in this brief time period, people are still doing what we would do today, sitting around a campfire, sharing some food and throwing the rubbish away. Oops. So that brings me to a close. And I hope what I've been able to do is to show you elements of what is one of the most important archives of Ice Age information, certainly anywhere in Europe and arguably in the world, certainly for the last half a million years. We've got an extraordinary record of different warm and cold stages, changing faunas, changing floras, and superimposed upon that, changing human species who are doing very different kinds of behaviour through time. So next time you're out and about walking near the Thames, crossing the Thames, hopefully hippos won't be too far from your mind. But really, I mean, certainly in terms of the river, there can be no more powerful reminder of how geology and geomorphology have shaped the city that we occupy now. If you'd like to find out more, um, there is um, a book, uh, The Thames Through Time, and um, I thank my co-authors on the book, Tony Marigi from the British Geological Survey, who's in the audience, and Mark White, an archaeologist from Durham, um, who made it great fun to write this. Uh, my colleague, Chris Stringer, who is the leader of our Ancient Human Occupation of Britain uh, project, he's written a wonderful book on Homo Britannicus, and also the Museum of London, because there is the London Before London Gallery, and they also have a wonderful site online where you can uh, see more information and images, some of which have been used in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful tour de force, two and a half million years in just under an hour. Uh, that's pretty good going, and a few fossil men on the way. Now, Daniel's able to answer a few questions, I hope. Absolutely. So uh, the floor is open. Remember not to speak until you've got the microphone. Our lady assistants will rush around. And there's a man with a hand already. So. Uh, good evening. Um, I was interested to know if you're able to find out the average lifespan of various species, including us, over the period you were talking, whether they vary or, um, ex or slowly extend all the time? 
The answer is yes, they do extend, um, but we do know now that, for example, Neanderthals matured apparently more rapidly than we do. So probably by the time you were hitting 40 as a Neanderthal, you would be you know, getting on for making old bones, really. So um, although it's difficult to actually get an insight into that, because, of course, um, some of these sites represent short-term aggregations, it's not as though we have a site which represents somebody living in one place for, for the entirety of their life. So it's difficult to assess from that basis. But yes, I mean, as we have gone on, um, and obviously dietary changes, then lifespan has increased. But we shouldn't forget that Neanderthals are different species. And yes, we know that um, childhood was short, and they matured a lot quicker than us. Thank you. Um, we've, you've mentioned Pakefield and the, uh, virtually the mouth of the proto-Thames. Is there any evidence for occupation further upstream? I'm thinking of the Vale of St. Albans, Croxley Green, Rickmansworth around there, where there, there are plenty of artifacts found, but as far as I can ascertain, they're all post-Anglian. Yes. Um, Croxley Green, so this is a site at Rickmansworth. It's actually one of the most productive sites anywhere. Um, it's an interesting site. The Vale of St Albans is obviously difficult because it was obliterated by ice for, for a la large part of um, you know, the, the period we would be interested in. Um, I have looked at the Croxley Green um, assemblage um, with my colleague Mark White and we came to the conclusion that the artefacts are most probably of Swanscombe age, so they're probably immediately after. Um, that doesn't mean that, I mean, there could be a, a component that might be pre-Anglian in age, but most of them appear to be after the Anglian glaciation. Uh, going on to the first question, you, you mentioned that the Neanderthals had uh, become extinct. Um, wh when was that exactly? Any reason why? The latest dates that we have for Neanderthals come from southern Europe, from Gibraltar and sites in southern Spain, and they date to about 29,000 years ago. What we can tell is that we have Neanderthals in Britain until maybe about 40,000 years ago. And then Neanderthals seem to start to retreat from the north. Uh, it's curious because Neanderthals had coped with climatic change and dramatic climate change. They'd lived through interglacials that were warmer than the ones that we have today. They'd also survived periods of intense cold. But yet, the prey that they depend on starts to change, and then modern humans come on the scene as well. So whilst I think Neanderthals are suffering because of repeated environmental fluctuations and the effect that that would have fragmenting their prey, driving the prey towards extinction, undoubtedly the arrival of modern humans presents a different challenge. And there are almost as many different reasons for extinction that have been put forward as, as there are weeks in the year. But um, modern humans seem to do things differently. Their brains are no bigger than Neanderthals, but we can think and communicate in rather different ways, and that may have just given us the edge as we headed towards the last glacial maximum. And so we may have outcompeted Neanderthals who were already suffering because of environmental factors anyway. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on about Neanderthals just a moment longer. Am I right in remembering that recently there's been some suggestion that the two human subspecies may have been able to interbreed, in which case, of course, they weren't separate species at all, and that that may have been a factor in the disappearance of the Neanderthal. Um, we have long recognised Neanderthals as a separate species, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens separately, but you're absolutely right that there has been some genetic work done recently which shows that in some people there has been a component, that a small component that appears to be in common with Neanderthals. Um, this doesn't mean there was widespread interbreeding, 
there may or may not have been. I think the thing is, when you look at Neanderthals, we would have recognised them as something, something other, something different. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't, um, you know, that there wasn't interbreeding on occasion. It appears to have conferred more of an advantage on modern humans in that it's, it's believed that it may have made them more resistant, for example, to certain diseases that were, say, you know, that were well established in, in say, North and Western Europe and, and in the Near East. Um, so there is evidence of some interbreeding. And yes, every time you find an instance of that, biologically, that defies the species concept. Um, all we can do is, is move on ahead with the genetic evidence as far as we can tell and try to see how that matches up with the fossil record. Why have the large mammals in northern Europe disappeared, but in Africa they haven't? That's a very interesting question, and one that relates both to environmental factors, but also to, um, to the presence of, of humans. So it's long been suggested that, and in fact you, you can see that very clearly with the way that modern humans have um, ravaged any area that they have gone into. So it's particularly prevalent on islands, for example. The later an area is colonised by humans, the more devastation we will wreak. Now, Africa is not only vast, so you've got a much bigger repository. Climatically, it was also somewhat more stable. So it's buffered from the big ice sheets and the effects that you, you see. That doesn't mean that there isn't environmental change, because there is, but there is, is much more of a buffering, whereas large parts of, of northern hemispheres became completely uninhabitable for long periods. So that, of course, would affect the fauna. So it's partly environmental, stability, large land mass, but also that the fauna that evolves alongside humans as we know happened in Africa, becomes quite, quite wary, if you like. Often you'll see that, um, uh, say for example, mammals and birds are described as ecologically naive because they, they haven't encountered humans before, so they're quite unwary. Whereas it's believed that because Africa had a long history of co-evolving with humans, the mammals were, were more wary and were less subject to <coughs> extinction. But... It's also the case that Neanderthals didn't hunt anything to extinction. They seem to be a lot more careful in the same way that other carnivores. No carnivore hunts its prey to extinction. Uh, and it's not necessarily because it's thinking cleverly about this, but simply when the prey becomes too rare in the landscape, it will switch to something else because that's, that's what's easier to, to procure. Um, Neanderthals may have done the same thing, but modern humans seem to be the ones who particularly focus on sort of prime age animals as well and, and eventually will hunt species to extinction. So megafauna has survived in Africa and Asia. That's the two places where they have survived. Huge extinctions in Australia, in South America, North America and to a more limited extent in Northern Europe. So... Two more. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the process that demolished the land bridge between ourselves and the continent? Um, Do you see it as sudden or gradual? Or? It seems to have been very sudden, as far as we can tell. Um, and the major breach occurred because of this overspill from the ice dammed lake in the southern North Sea Basin. So it would have cut through the chalk. Once that breach was made, it was probably enlarged very, very rapidly. They're dating this is very, very difficult, and there is some suggestion that there could have been a second later breach at around 180,000, but certainly the major breach happens during the Anglian glaciation as a result of the overspill from this lake. And the lady down there, were you? Microphone on its way. It's kind of on the same subject, in a sense. Well, how wide would the actual original channel have been when the first bre breach was made? And kind of how quickly... You said it would grow quite quickly, but would it 
have grown in fits and starts due to the glaciation and interglacial regions, or would it kind of have grown gradually? I, I don't think there is anyone who can answer that question, I have to say, because, of course, all we are left now with are relics buried channels under the sea, which represent the final sort of, you know, the final iteration, if you like. Um, I, I don't know enough about how quickly chalk would erode, but having discussed this with chalk geologists, I'm told that something pretty forceful like that would have enlarged it very, very rapidly. And it creates incredibly deep and very wide channels. And the Channel River eventually went on for, for kilometres. It was a formidable biogeographical barrier. So I suspect that once initiation of the breach happened, it, it would have been fairly rapid. Um, and then, of course, you, you have a, 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 a very much altered time frame for people and animals coming in and out from that point onwards. But I'm not sure anybody... I don't think we've ever seen... I mean, obviously, we've got... got case studies of, of big floods, for example, and you can see the devastation that causes. I find it even, I find it hard to actually visualise the magnitude of what would have happened with this enormous, you know, wall, wall of water breaking through the chalk, but I should think it was pretty quick and quite dramatic. Oh, this will be the last one, I think, or our wine will be getting too warm. <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Then. Thank you very much, uh, sir. <laughs> uh, just two points. Um, as far as survival of large mammals in uh, northern Europe is concerned, of course, the aurochs survived until the 18th century. I think the last one was killed in Poland around 1750 or something. Polish Zoo, I think it died in. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, the other point I was going to make, the, uh, the breach of the, the lake to form the, uh, the channel... Um, has a much larger analogy, I think, in the formation of the, the Black Sea when the Mediterranean broke through, and that must have dwarfed the, uh, <laughs> uh, the channel. And, uh, Absolutely, yes, you're quite right that, yes, we do have, from the geological record, other instances of catastrophic <coughs> situations such as that, but rapidity and magnitude is something that, you know, that we're still, you know, I'm not sure we... we have an answer for in terms of the channel breach. And on the subject of the large mammals, you're quite right that in the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, at the beginning we had not only aurochs, um, we also had um, elk, so another large mammal, um, and red deer as well. So these were the largest ones that were, were left to us. Um, but these are all animals that are able to survive in quite dense forests and they don't necessarily at, at that point occur in great big herds either. So the ones that did survive tend to be more adaptable. So red deer, for example, are very flexible. They can actually adjust their rumen either to feed on greys if it's available or to feed on browse, whereas aurochs and elk are both very characteristic of sort of dense forests and so elk very solitary as well. So we do have a handful of large mammals that survive and then eventually, of course, go extinct. Aurochs are a separate case, of course, because we domesticated them. But in the wild, yes, they did survive in Poland, I think, until the 17th century. So. Right. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we've had a wonderful evening, and it's interesting how the points you made in your lecture have been picked up in the questions. Uh, it's, I think they've added a lot to this... Uh, little over an hour. So thank you very much. Could you join me in thanking Daniel in the normal way? Thank you. Well, let us adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>